The Agile Practice Guide is PMI's publication for Agile, whether you're taking the PMP, the PMI ACP, the CAPM, and other certifications. It's important you know what's in it. So let's get through it in 10 minutes. The Agile Practice Guide Summary. What is Agile, first and foremost? Agile is a mindset. It is a way you should process the world around you. It is a way you should think. It's a way that you should pivot according to the world around you and what is happening. I've been a scrum master since 2011. I've got all sorts of other certifications in Agile. I've got six certifications that are Agile related. I'm very passionate about you understanding this guide, hence the review. This is the breakdown of the chapters. There's an introduction, an introduction to Agile, life cycle selection, which is pretty important, implementing Agile, implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. Chapter six is about organizational considerations for project agility, and chapter seven is a call to action. Let's talk about chapter one. The summary is why this guide? This guide is important because PMI takes a project spin on Agile and presents it in this publication. So it is relevant, especially now we're going into the world of hybridization, definitely one you want to know about. Let's go to chapter two. It's called an introduction to Agile. Two types of work, definable work and high uncertainty work. If you're working on high uncertainty projects, you wanna use an Agile approach because it's better to cope with change and complexity. Definable work, it's better for you to use a predictive approach. The Agile Manifesto is talked about in this book and we've got four values. I'm gonna give you the summary. Value individuals and how they interact more than processes and tools. Value working software over comprehensive documentation. Value customer collaboration over contract negotiation and value responding to change over following a plan. You can find a full manifesto at agilemanifesto.org. Now, on top of that, there's also an understanding of the principles. And I'm gonna give you a different spin for the Agile Manifesto principles. I break them into people principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. Welcome changing requirements so that you can add value to your customer and enable them harness change for their competitive advantage. Build projects around motivated individuals. The most efficient and effective method of communicating is face-to-face -face conversation. Process, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Still on process, you gotta pay attention to technical excellence. It'll save you a whole lot of fan cleaning. Simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. Don't do busy work. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective. They tune and adjust accordingly after retrospective. Business, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project, deliver work in software frequently. Why? Because you're doing things in small iterations and you need to deliver quick so that we can inspect and understand if you're going in the right direction. Work in software is a primary measure of progress. We don't do percent completes in the world of Agile and the best architectures, requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. And those are the 12 principles at a very high level. The PMI has a really helpful table here that helps you see how each value is explained and how each principle is explained across the chapters. So when I think about Agile as presented in this book, we've got four values, 12 principles and a boatload of practices from pages 50 forward explained. So when we talk about project management, we can either run our projects using a simple approach or using a more complex coping mechanism or approach or an anarchy coping approach, which is called agile. Predictive works best down here where the requirements are close to agreement and the technical approach is close to certainty. So we have two axes here and I want you to be aware of these two axes. We have on the Y axis, we have the requirements. And on the X axis, we have technicality. So page 14 in this book 
if you take a look, we have requirements uncertainty, and then we have technical degree of uncertainty. And I'm just going to use the R so that you really anchor back this concept of what we call the Stacy complexity model, requirements and technical. And when you are far from certainty, you find yourself in the zone of anarchy, moving from complexity into anarchy. That's a perfect place to use Agile. So Agile works best when there's high variability, need to experiment to discover, and change is likely. Predictive in this simple zone works best when the requirements are well understood. Another key part of PMI's Agile practice guide is the continuum of life cycles. And this just shows you when to use predictive, low degree of change, low frequency of delivery, when to use Agile, high degree of change, high frequency of delivery. To give you more clarity, you've got to take a look at page 18, which breaks down predictive, iterative, incremental, and Agile. So if you are in a predictive zone, you're going to deliver one time. And this is a major difference between predictive and Agile, single delivery for predictive, frequent small deliveries in the world of Agile. Iterative is one that always throws people for a loop because people think it's multiple. It's not. It's a single delivery. So iterative and predictive are actually neighbors. They both have a single delivery. The only difference is that iterative is focused on repeating till correct. So we have a lot of prototyping going on. Incremental. One time per iteration for the activities, but we have frequent smaller deliveries. Now, it's easy to get confused with incremental and agile, but there's a major difference. Incremental is one time per iteration. Agile is repeat till correct. So when is it best to use incremental? Best to use incremental when the change is small. The degree of change is low. As you can see on this continuum, we have predictive and incremental having that as a similarity. So predictive has a similarity with incremental in that the change is low. It has a similarity with iterative in that it has a one-time delivery, low frequency of delivery. This is a major thing you need to get from chapter two. Going into chapter three, I'm gonna give you the skinny of chapter three. The skinny of chapter three is that we've got predictive life cycles where things are done linearly. We've got iterative life cycles where we've got feedback loops. We repeat until correct. We've got incremental life cycles. And in these, you can see that we've got varying sizes of increments. We've got two types of agile life cycles to talk about. We've got iteration-based agile and we've got flow-based agile. Iteration-based agile, you can see the cadence has made all of those iterations the same size, but in flow-based agile, you can see that the sizes are of different lengths, different cadences in that world. Still in chapter three, big thing is understanding that hybridized approaches are now here. And we have in this example, agile development followed by a predictive rollout, but you could also have an agile and predictive approach smack dab on top of each other. I call that an agile predictive sub, or you can have a whole lot of agile and a little bit of predictive sprinkled in. We call that a largely agile approach with a predictive component, or you could have a whole lot of predictive and a little bit of agile sprinkled in, and we call that a largely predictive approach with agile components. It just makes sense that now you've got the best of both worlds. You've got to juggle them and make them make sense for you as a professional, and that's what you're going to be tested on on some of these exams. Let's talk about implementing agile. How do you implement agile? Start with an agile mindset. Managing a project using an agile approach requires that the project team adopt an agile mindset. Remember, Agile is a mindset. Now you want to think about the order in this way. Purpose first, because where there's no vision, the people are going to perish. We have purpose first. Then we think about the people. The people, once we know the vision, right? So an Agile approach emphasizes servant leadership. So you've got to think first about why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing? Then the people, we create the team environment, and then we focus on value and outcomes, not process. Servant leadership is big in this chapter. It involves promoting self-awareness, listening, helping people grow, promoting the energy and intelligence of others, relationships management, being an impartial bridge builder, removing bottlenecks, the ability to remove impediments. And on the exam, you'll hear the PMI refer quite a lot to servant leadership or a team lead 
all a project lead, but not necessarily always called a project manager. And the reason is servant leadership is what you should have in the forefront. Okay, what is the role of a project manager in the world of Agile? Someone says, well, I'm a project manager and I have no job. That's not true. It might be somewhat of an unknown, but project managers are different. So they need to move from being at the center to being a servant. It's not just a play on words. Go from being at the center where everyone's saying, that's the PM, that's the boss. No, we want to go from that to being a servant. Let's move on to the next chapter. Next chapter is about implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. The big thing in this world is the charter. No charter, no project. Also in the world of Agile, every project needs a project charter and Agile projects are no exception. They need project charters. Why? So that the vision can be crafted and so that they can be direction. Now there's also something we call chartering. We need to create a team charter. Teams that have been working together for eons may not need to create a team charter every single project. But where the team has not worked together in that way, a charter could help. There are many things we call a team charter. We call it a social contract. We call it a team contract. We call it a team agreement. you got to be aware of this. The rest of this chapter talks about events in Agile. So we have retrospectives. The retrospective is the single most important practice as documented by PMI on page 50. We also talk about backlog preparation. How do items get into the backlog? Did aliens drop them off? No. There's got to be some interface between stakeholders, the product owner, and ultimately will get put into a backlog. Ultimately, a roadmap will be crafted. Then we talk about backlog refinement. We talk about backlog refinement in that we need to refine our backlog. Our backlog, remember, is a list of all the things that the customer wants, but it doesn't mean that it's all the things the customer is gonna get. So in iteration-based Agile, the product owner often works with the team to prepare some stories for the upcoming iteration. So that's a big one to take note of. Still in the guide, we have the daily standups. Daily standups are really for syncing up. They're not for giving status. We call that an anti-pattern. We also hear talk about demos or reviews. It's the role of the product owner to know who to invite to these meetings and to get these meetings flowing sensibly. Also, what makes a project agile is the fact that you are delivering in increments, frequently listening to what the customer says and then getting some new stories, putting those back into the pipeline. And remember, in the world of agile, we do repeat until correct. So whether there is technical debt or whether there are things we discover that are outright defects, those are going to be fixed. We also talk about planning for iteration-based Agile, and that means sprint planning. So in sprint planning, you're going to be aware of capacity, you're going to be aware of story sizing, so on and so forth. That concludes that chapter, my friends. We're on to chapter six. Chapter six is organizational considerations for project agility. The bottom line is this. In the world of Agile, PMOs do exist, but PMOs are not draconian. PMOs invite people to a conversation if there's interest. So every project exists in an organizational context, cultures, structures, and policies can influence both the direction and the outcome of any project. So it would make sense if you wanted to introduce Agile to a firm for you to actually start with training, coaching at a higher level, begin to use these concepts at a higher level so management can really embrace them and then begin to teach people these practices. And when they embrace them, it's going to be a lot easier for the company to indeed be agile. Here, we also talk about procurements and contracts and there are all sorts of contracts on page 77. I would highly advise knowing those contract types. We have multi-tiered, emphasizing value delivered, fixed price increments, NTE time and materials, graduated time and materials, early cancellation, giving people an off-ramp, dynamic scope option, team augmentation, and favoring full service suppliers. These are things that just make sense to do. Chapter seven is called a call to action. And this is where the PMI says, hey, we want to encourage you to be engaged in the broader communities of project management and agile to further conversations in these topics. And then after this page, we go into a lot of detail. 
what makes integration what it is in the world of agile it's the team being the integrators what makes scope what it is we spend less time trying to define and agree on scope in the early stage of the project instead we want a process for its ongoing discovery we do lightweight scheduling lightweight costing quality is all about having those regular retrospectives regular checks on the effectiveness resource management in this world we don't call people resources in the world of agile that's a big no-no but projects with high variability benefit from team structures that have collaboration flexibility and t-shaped skills communications we've got to communicate quick so we use information radiators we use osmotic communication risk is not negated in agile believe it or not a lot of teams use risk registers but you got to remember that there's a difference between a risk and an impediment. A risk is an impediment waiting to happen. So we want to catch these before they become impediments. In the world of procurement, we do MSAs, master services agreements. We're not just tunnel visioned into a fixed, fixed, fix, but we want flexible arrangements. Stakeholder management, remember business people and developers, they got to work together daily throughout the project. I close with this again, remember you've got these tables that show you how the manifesto values and principles are painted throughout the chapters. And don't forget, we have a boatload of other agile frameworks talked about, everything from Scrum to Kanban, and I'm gonna just touch on one, which is scaling. Talk about a Scrum of Scrums. We can see that a Scrum of Scrums just takes one member from each group and scales that up so that at higher levels we can have less people meeting free people up to do work and coordinate at those higher levels and that my friends is the end of our agile practice guide summary i hope you found it to be useful and i hope it equips you and catapults you into excellence for either exam you're taking acp pmp capm or whatever exam you may be focused on Thank you very much. I wish you all the very best. Let me know if you've got any questions. Bye for now.